Welcome to Touch My Heart, Communicate with Impact. Ideas are the currency of the 21st century. Your ability to communicate your ideas persuasively is the single greatest skill you need to accomplish your dreams. And spreading your ideas in the 21st century requires a 21st century model of communication. So let me introduce you to hugs. To communicate with impact, we have to touch the heart of our audience. To do that, we must understand who they are, what makes them tick, and what they want. We share our ideas by giving them away. And lastly, we need to tell them the idea with a story. And if we want to communicate an idea, well, we have to start somewhere. Most often, we begin by setting the context. Where are we starting and who is involved with what? Meet Barry. I first met Barry outside a pub in a very rough part of town, near the college where I worked. My role at that time was heading up a new EU-funded access to IT course for unemployed youths with few or no formal qualifications to enable them to get into university thereby reducing the massive unemployment numbers in the UK and getting them off the streets. Barry was a hard man. He was the sort of person who, when seen, the best advice would be to cross the street or walk the other way. And he was exactly the sort of individual that my course was aimed at. I talked to Barry and his mates and passed the Barry a flyer. He crumpled it up and suggested where I might insert it. Well, my mamma didn't raise no fool. I backed off and walked away. A couple of weeks later, imagine my surprise when Barry walks into my classroom. My students, for the first time ever, were silent and studying their textbooks intently. As Barry called me over, demanding to know what this was all about, as he proffered the crumpled flyer toward me. This is in the days well before mobile phones, so no one was going to be video recording this for posterity and no one was going to be calling the police. I invited Barry over to a table in the other corner of the room. At least then one of my students could slip out of the door and find security, but no, they continued to study their text. Barry sat and quietly told me about his very unpleasant childhood. He'd been expelled from school at 15 for fighting. He'd spent very little time actually in school anyway, but wandered the streets with his mates. He tried to get jobs, but with no O-levels and hardly able to read or write, wasn't really qualified for anything. And besides, people were just too scared to take him on. We talked some more and Barry filled in the application and I told him we'd help him with his English and maths with some extra classes. Barry joined the course. He sat alone at one desk and the other students avoided eye contact. So what's happening inside our brains when we are communicating? Well, one part of the brain you need to know about is the prefrontal cortex, or the PFC. The PFC is often called the executive centre of the brain. I liken the PFC to a theatre stage. As you focus on something, it's like putting an actor on stage. Meanwhile, your eyes, ears, skin and nose continue receiving hundreds and thousands of bits of information, all vying for your attention. Whether it's the chatter of a neighbour, a movement off to the side, the sound of a door opening, or the gentle hum of the air conditioning. This is like actors streaming onto the stage from the wings, flitting across just long enough for you to decide if they are worthy of your attention. Meanwhile, your thought life continues unabated. Perhaps you're thinking about food, or maybe you're planning an evening out, or an upcoming birthday. Each of these thoughts is like an audience member, clamouring onto the stage, vying for time in the spotlight. And as I mention each of these things, your attention, even if ever so briefly, flitted off to them. All of this time, I want your attention. And your attention requires an enormous amount of energy in your brain and our brain, quite sensibly, uses energy wisely. If something is no longer worth our attention, we'll switch it off to something more worthy, even if that is the gentle hum of the air conditioning. 
Brain scans reveal that stories stimulate and engage the human brain, helping the speaker connect with the audience and making it much more likely that the audience will agree with the speaker's point of view. From a storytelling perspective, the way to keep an audience's attention is to continually increase the tension in the story. Once a story has sustained our attention long enough, we may begin to emotionally resonate with the story's characters, and we're transported into the story. Our mirror neurons fire, and we feel the passion, the fear, the trepidation, the joy. In short, we empathise with the characters of the story. This remarkable feat of our brains is down to a neurochemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone. What we do know is that oxytocin makes us more sensitive to social cues around us. In many situations, those cues motivate us to engage, to help others, particularly if the other person seems to need our help, whether that person is real or fictional, as in a story. So it's the job of the story layer to drip feed the information you are sharing whilst touching the heart. Rather like turning on the hot and cold water taps, hot for the emotions and cold for the cold facts and data. The more you hook the information into the heart, the more your audience will remember. But I can't touch your heart and tell you a story if I don't get your attention first. So, how do we do that? Well, now we need to know about two new areas of the brain. The ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, and the nucleus accumbens. Remember the PFC theatre, all those actors vying for attention? Well, cortisol focuses our attention on something important. And this is something that's new, unexpected, or potentially threatening. It's a piece of information from the outside, or sometimes your inner world, that is deemed worthy of attention. And attention is drawn to your PFC by your anterior cingulate cortex. The ACC is continuously scanning for newness, like a trigger-happy security card. Your ACC will then help trigger the production of cortisol. And distress is how you feel when cortisol is produced. In many stories, we want to increase distress to make you feel at least a little anxious to know what happens next. And the level of cortisol that you need, how much distress, to pay attention depends on your experience and your immediate circumstances. We keep someone's attention by encouraging dopamine production. Dopamine makes you feel good. It's our happy chemical. It's also key in consolidating memory, whereas too much cortisol impairs memory. A great story brings a balance of both. You increase the tension and enable small wins to increase satisfaction. And if I'm doing this well, you have oxytocin and some cortisol continuously being produced. And every time I allow my story to give you a little satisfaction, you'll get a dose of dopamine, the happy chemical. Barry's lack of formal education comes to the fore and he flunks his first assignment. I even wanted to change his grade, just in case. Barry is not happy. Barry comes up to me after class. I'm alone in a basement classroom with a man who scares me and is upset. Barry tells me how upset he is, but not with me, with himself. He tells me why he never went to school and that the only thing he was good for was looking hard. So I take my time and slowly and steadily, Barry makes progress. By the end of the year, Barry is scraping through his assignments. His scores are okay. They're not great, but they're good enough. And then he dares to apply to UMIST a top-notch IT school in the university, renowned for only taking on the best. Sadly, most communication is cold tap only, and the information that you receive leaks rapidly. The report is usually like this. 
full of data and facts and figures. If your attention is grabbed at all, it's likely because it's a threat for you. The job after, of a report, after all, is to convey facts. But when it's just data and bullet points, tables of numbers, we principally use just two areas of our brains, known as Vernix and Broca's areas. These areas deal with language processing. There's no heart and no soul, and rarely anything visually appealing to stimulate our brains, let alone our emotions. So, how do we enliven even the dullest of meetings? Well, why does the other person need to know this? What's the outcome? What's the end going to be? And what's in it for them? For this, we need to understand them and touch the heart. And we can use the same principles in any communication, whether we want to change a belief or point of view, give new insights or develop someone's abilities, make a recommendation or just convey facts. We increase tension by digging into the pain of the current situation and then building the game. We know that the brain craves certainty and our default or narrative network fills in the story blanks as we communicate. We might fill in the blanks positively or negatively. How we fill in those blanks comes down to our own experience, knowledge and the maps we saw in our own brains. Powerful stories include a few twists and turns to keep you just a little uncertain, but take too long to provide satisfaction and you lose the audience in their own inner world of blank filling. Great communicators like Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy or Steve Jobs keep switching between this is how it is, bad, this is how it could be, good. After Barry applied to UMIST and finished the course, I heard nothing. I don't know whether he got in. I didn't know what had happened. My project at the college came to an end. I'd set up the programmes, gotten the funding, and now it was time to move on. I went to Paris, then to Dusseldorf, then over to Hong Kong, and finally I came to Singapore. Now, some 10 years later. I'm back in the UK running a workshop. Got 50 people in the room and we're halfway through the first day, and Barry sneaks into the back of the room. He's shaven bald now, scars on his face still evident, wearing jeans and a t-shirt, looking every bit as tough as he ever did. But something has changed. At the break, Barry comes up to the front, speaking softly. We sit for coffee, and he tells me that he had gotten into UMIST. Apparently, I'd given him a good reference, and the Dean of Admissions was welcoming, thanks to my forewarning that Barry was about to walk into her office. He'd graduated with honours, and now he had set up a business to produce community videos. The type of video aimed at getting youngsters off drugs and back into school. He was active in the local community, leading initiatives to clean up the area and provide opportunities for disadvantaged kids. Then Barry went quiet and tears in his eyes and said, thank you. He told me that I'd been the first person in his life to give him a chance. Someone who believed in him and helped him to be the person he could be and that I'd inspired him to do the same for others. He now knew that he could change his community into something to be proud of, and he knew that when you believe in someone, give them a chance and pour your life into them, then you change the world. We spent the evening together watching the physios he'd produced, and I asked him how he went about it. And here it is. Show them you care, understand their issues, situation, their problems and relate to them. Give them something that will help them and entertain them with a story. It's hugs. Touch my heart. Understand me. Give me something new and tell me a story. And he told me how to do this. But my time is up. I will have to wait for another day. And isn't that what we all want to do? Barry is the reason I continue to do what I do. To help the people I serve become bigger, 
better versions of themselves. My name is Dr. John Kenworthy, and it has been a pleasure to share with you.